Hi! Welcome to the season two finale of Conversations with a Wounded Healer. I'm your host, Sarah Buino, and today is the last episode of the season, you guys. We're going to be taking a break for a little bit, but do not worry. We will come back. We've already recorded the episode. Everything's set to go. Early January, you'll see us again. But we're going to take a break. We're going to try to rest. I'm going to try to rest. I think other people are better at resting than I am. But... One thing I wanted to share with you, if you wanted to still hang out over the holidays, even though I won't be recording new episodes, best place to find me is on Instagram at Head Heart Therapy. And I'm super into reposting amazing things that other people share because I don't I don't have the most brilliant things to say. I'll just share what other people say. Um, so hang out with me there. Come talk with me there. I really would love to engage with more folks on Instagram. So today's guest, I'm really excited to discuss with you because James came to me. So I run a little Facebook group in the Chicagoland area for folks who specialize in substance use disorders. And I saw him pop up as requesting to be in the group. And I'm like, who is this motherfucker? And I looked and he's friends with a mutual friend of mine and realized he doesn't live in Chicago, but he had this really cool project that he wanted to get out there. And so I was like, no, you can't join my group, but give me everything you have. I want to help you. I really want to further this mission. And so I really specifically wanted him to be the last episode because this is so important. This is very, very close to my heart. And obviously you'll hear James's passion about it as well. So today's guest is James McDonald. And he originally hails from Seattle, but he's a Milwaukee transplant and current counseling psychology PhD student at Marquette University. He's an aspiring psychologist and a researcher passionate about whole person healing. So I know you're really going to dig this episode and be really inspired. And please, 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 if you are someone who has gone through addiction yourself and meets these qualifications, reach out to James. He's an amazing person. And I think that this work is so, so crucial. So please enjoy my interview with James McDonald. Hello, James McDonald. Welcome to Conversations with a Wounded Healer. Hi, Sarah. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm really excited to have this discussion. I've not talked to a researcher on here before. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, you're number one, so no press. Yeah, really. And it's also strange to be referred to as a researcher. <laughs> Is it? I feel like, yeah, a little bit. Oh. Um, just because in my mind, I'm still very much a student in the PhD land. So the idea of being a researcher feels feels far away still, even though there's some of that happening. So yeah, still getting used to that idea. Well, before we dig into all of it, why don't you tell folks, if you want to introduce yourself as a student, fine, you're a student slash researcher, but introduce yourself to the listeners and tell them who you are and what you do. Absolutely. So yeah, my name is James McDonald. I am a PhD student at Marquette University studying counseling psychology. I'm actually getting close to wrapping up and finishing my degree, working on my dissertation at the moment. And originally from Seattle, grew up, spent most of my life over there and then moved over to Milwaukee for graduate school in 2015. And it took me like a minute to figure out the city, but then fell in love pretty quickly and have mm -hmm. enjoyed living here quite a bit. So there's a lot of richness in the city. So yeah, um, I, this is so embarrassing, but I really don't know the difference between Milwaukee and Madison. Totally fair. Is it fair? Okay, I'm not an idiot. <laughs> I mean, I, I think so. Maybe there's people in Wisconsin that are cringing right now. Maybe. But, you know, Sorry, me being guys. from, yeah, right. <laughs> me being from Seattle, they feel kind of similar. So I think there's like that similar kind of like more city, more urban, yeah. a little bit more of a liberal bent to both of those right. areas, you know, a lot more college kind of things happening. So I think right. I'm being similar in that way. Yeah, cool. Yeah. And we, quote unquote, met online because we have a mutual friend, Stephanie Hood, who yeah. works in the addiction field in Chicago. And then you had asked to join our, our little Chicago substance use disorders group. And I was like, no, but I will help you because <laughs> we're trying to keep that group just for like local resources and whatnot. Sure. And other people have done the same. And I'm like, sorry, I'm really trying to keep it local. But what you were doing was of such interest to me that, A, I wanted to share it with people, you know, just in Chicago. And also I wanted to have you on the podcast to share. So would you mind telling people about your research? Yeah, I'd love to. And thank you for your help with that. So my study is on the experience of healing from opioid addiction. 
So my thinking is that there's a lot of stuff in the press about overdose. There's a lot of stuff in the press about, you know, rates of use and all these types of things, but we don't really hear any narratives about people really getting better, Mm -hmm. which I think kind of contributes to the idea that people don't get better, that it's this killer thing. And that's, that's the only way that it can go. And it's just not the case at all. So I was really interested in hearing from people who've really gone through that recovery journey to a place where they really feel like they're healing, not just Mm -hmm. like physically, but like mind, body, spirit, whole person really healing. And I think, you know, part of that perspective, too, is that people start using for a reason. You know, it's not just because I wanted to. Maybe that's part of it. But there's usually a lot of other stuff that are happening, too. So just really curious about how that unfolds for people. So I've had some success thanks to you and, and a couple other oh, folks. Good, good. Stephanie Hood as well. So I've done a, a few interviews now with people. So it's a qualitative study. So it's usually mm, about mm-hmm. 60 to 90 minutes of, of an interview where, you know, we sit down and talk and I have like a few questions, but it's a lot of kind of the person guiding me about how their healing journey unfolded. What were the really important parts for them? How have they been changed? Those kinds of things. And I think, you know, long term, I'd love to kind of take some of the things that people have talked about and try to just make the services that we offer to people better. Oh, yes. Yeah. So that, (laughs) yeah, right? Yes. it's, It's hard kind of coming from the other perspective where you're like, I think that this is what people need, or I think this is what might be helpful, but to actually hear from people themselves about what were the most important things, I think would just help us kind of narrow down and figure out what we need to give people. I have a feeling that you and I are going to have to do a project together at some point because I have had all of these ideas for research studies swimming around in my head and I have no interest in learning the research part, Okay. but the qualitative it's absolutely the way that I would want to go. Okay, so I'm going to put a pin in that cool. and you and I are just going to stay in contact. But you clearly are very passionate about this topic. And I find that in this sort of profession, there's usually a personal reason that we go into it. And so whatever you feel comfortable sharing about what led you to wanting to do this work. Yeah, it's a great question. I think I've actually had to do a lot of thinking about this lately, too, Mm. because I wanted to be aware of where I was coming from and what perspective is kind of driving me. Mm. I think it started early on. I grew up going to 12 step meetings. My dad Mm. was in recovery for a long time. I always felt this sense of community and belonging in those places and Mm. just like, you know, really got to know people because, you know, it was his home meeting. And so I'd see the same people every week, year after year, and, you know, always got a hug from them and just mm. kind of loved being part of the community. And he, he struggled with addiction quite a bit. So there was times when he would be back to using and then, you know, mm. back to meetings and going back and forth with that. But for me, it always felt like kind of close to my heart. And so kind of going through elementary school and having like people be like, oh, you know, drugs are bad, drugs are evil. People that do drugs are bad people just never felt right to me because I knew those people. So, you know, as I got interested in doing therapy and I got interested in counseling, you know, I kept seeing that pattern happening over and over, you know, in the emergency rooms, the doctors are like, oh, you know, blah, 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 is an addict, like just discharge them, even though it's like, you can just hear the misery that they're in. And how unhelpful I think that attitude is of not understanding the humanity behind the experience. And so I think in some ways I feel called to speak about some of that humanity. I feel that. Like, it's electric. I feel it. That's great. Because I think at the same time, you know, not being part of the community myself, there's sort of this like, I want to do what I can to really help move forward the way that we think about addiction. And at the same time, I want to check in with the people who are going through it and being like, am I being helpful the way that you need me to be helpful? Yeah. So I think there's some interesting tension with that, but I've been very reassured with this particular project and partially from people like yourself and like other people who have been interested in participating that it's not totally off the wall oh or God. inappropriate, you know, I'm like, yeah. okay, good. I'm, I'm glad this is like a helpful question to ask. So but yeah, I think that's part of it. And my dad, I think I, you know, I was kind of saying he he struggled with it so much. And in some ways, I think he started to recover. In some ways, he got better. But in other ways, that never really happened for him. He right. passed away. And I think, yeah, I'm like left with this kind mm. of sense of it's not the whole experience. It's not the whole journey. And so I'm really curious about for other people, how does that journey end? Or what are the components that I didn't get to see kind of growing right. up there that are really important? 
So it's like a whole mix of things. We like to joke in the program about it being, instead of it being research, it ends up being more me search because it's always about like us and our experiences always. to some extent. Yeah. And if it's not, then the passion and the, the electricity isn't there, right? Right. Why would you want to really devote so much time and energy to something that you didn't care so much about? At right. least that's that's how I approach it. So yeah, it's definitely close to my heart. And I, I'm really grateful to people being willing to talk about how they're healing from opioid mm-hmm, addiction, mm-hmm. because there can be a lot of stigma. And it's not a question that I think people get asked very often. Right. So I'm really grateful to be able to try to piece together how that unfolds and hear some of those voices. I am just loving all of this. So we could go in a trillion different places. <laughs> What I'm hearing in this too, really, is is this is creating an opportunity for you to heal. Yeah, I think there's that component too, right? It's like having seen somebody struggle so much and then die. And Did he die as a result of addiction? He died of liver cancer. So, so it yeah, was like, kinda. yeah, like directly, but not super directly. Right. So right. And there were so many complications to it. Like with this background of addiction, you know, the pain medication for cancer didn't work the way that it should have. And there was like all these elements to it that I just didn't think of. But thinking back across his life, I was like, you know, wow, yeah, he's really come a long way. And he's he's grown mm-hmm. in so many ways. And I was having to write kind of explaining some about my values. And I was talking about trying to learn about humility from him because he was always mm-hmm. like admitting when he was wrong and trying to like wow. practice the principles that 12 steps programs teach. And like, yeah. you know, and I got to see that and be the recipient of that as like this little kid or this giant man is like apologizing. What a gift. Yeah, that was such a gift, you know? So on the one hand, it's like, I can think of all these gifts that I've been given from his experience and going through addiction and like learning like how to be the best person he could be. And at the same time, he did die and he didn't really get to the point where he was doing really well and like thriving. Yeah. So I think there is some healing for me too, with like wanting to know that those people are out there, that they do end up doing a lot better. It's not just this thing that can take over your life forever. <sighs> I just want to sit in that for a minute. <laughs> yeah. I'm just, ooh, I just knew it's so funny how I just kind of get these like pings of like, you're supposed to talk to this person. The podcast has been such a great way to facilitate these amazing conversations because this just inspires the fuck out of me. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it seems like it's resonating with you to some degree as well. There's a couple of things we could talk about. I guess one of the things that I think might be interesting for listeners, because the people who listen to this podcast, I have clients who listen to it. I have therapists who listen to it. There are aspiring therapists who listen to it. And then sure. part of what I really like to unpack is my own relationship to, you know, all of the themes and yeah. thinking about, I don't think I actually have ever talked about on the show the feeling of imposter syndrome that comes from working in addiction when you yourself do not identify as an addict. You mentioned that a little bit. Do you want to expand on that? Definitely. Yeah. And I think there's so many nuances to it because it is that imposter syndrome. It is that like, no, I haven't gone through that. And I think especially in the field of addiction, there's such a history of people who have struggled with it, then becoming counselors themselves you know, and people talking so much about like, unless you've been through it, unless you've lived it, like, you don't know what it's like. Right. And that's true. Like, I would never argue with that. That is 100% true. So it's like, can I still offer something that's meaningful, even though I wasn't part of the journey in the same way that you were, you know, but for me, it still feels kind of personal, because there is some family background, some personal Mm -hmm. experience. So yeah, I think it's really complicated. And I think clients have reacted differently. I always try to be really transparent about, I don't identify as an addict myself. I haven't been through it in that same way. Mm -hmm. And as soon as I say that, then there's always part of me that wants to defend it and be like, but I come from addiction, but but I know people, you know, and just like kind of qualify (laughs) it. So it's like, you can trust me. Like, and of course, like that isn't going to be helpful. They have to make their own decision about that. But it's hard, I think, to just let that be for me. Yeah. You know, and I, I've been in the field now for 10 years and I really, really struggled with it at the beginning much, much more than I do now. And my fear was always like, people were going to like, they were going to ask and then they weren't going to take me seriously. Right. And I would need to defend my right to be there and support them. And what I found, I've actually never had a person tell me that they didn't feel I was qualified to help them. A lot of times they are. It's it's funny. I One of the places where this happens most often is I go into a detox every Monday and I do a group on shame and trauma. Much needed. Yeah. 
it eventually comes out at some point that I, I don't identify as an addict myself and they're always mm-hmm. shocked. <laughs> <laughs> and I take that as a compliment, you know, and yeah. I try to let them know I don't know what it's like to have been through what you've been through. The things that I do relate to are doing things over and over despite negative consequences that's just manifested not with drugs but with other things for me. And then also I think I really relate to the darkness that people with addiction struggle with. And I don't know exactly why or how, but when I hear somebody's addiction story, I just, I feel that like on Grey's Anatomy, they were like the twisty dark feeling, right? Like I've been there. I've wanted to kill myself, right? Like that I get. That black hole. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Do you relate to that too? Definitely. Yeah. And I think people have described it so eloquently, like that twisty feeling is a, is a nice description because, you know, there's always this sort of fear in people's voice when we talk about right. that dark place, because it's like, it can swallow me or this fear of it being able to swallow me. And it's so easy for people to say like, oh no, you know, you just need to let those feelings be and like feel them and do all these things that we're told to do. But, mm-hmm. but what if it does swallow me? Right. Like right. that's always the fear. And I relate to that. I feel like on the scale of like emotion regulation, my emotions, I'm like (laughs) so (laughs) fucking big. I think that's the other piece that I relate to with people in addiction is is the emotions are just really big. And I was with my therapist on Thursday, literally fearing that I was going to be consumed by the anxiety that I'm experiencing lately. So that, that I get. Yeah, it just feels so real. Yeah. And at the same time, that's our humanity, like our capacity to feel things that much, you know, wow. But when you're in the depths of it, no, it does not feel like it could ever be a good thing. Right. Wow. It's funny, like normally I can process at the same time the questions that I'm going to ask next, but I'm like sure. just so in this with you. It's probably <laughs> really, like just so listeners know I'm doing a different recording service and this is a video. And so now I'm watching you too. And right, I'm even right. like more in it and the questions are not coming right now. But okay, I remember the question. So You know, in this research that you've decided to do, you could have chosen a ton of words to represent the person who maintains sobriety and gets sober and moves forward with their life, but you chose the word heal. And I'm really curious about that. Yeah, I'm really glad you asked that question because I ended up actually having to write quite a bit in my dissertation proposal for my committee about the choice of the word healing Mm. because, you know, it was chosen intentionally as opposed to abstinence or as opposed to recovery. And I think there's a few reasons, but to be most honest and most transparent, like that feels like the thing that I had the most energy and excitement about finding out. Like somehow healing felt like it was like broad and all encompassing and could mean like so many different things to different people. Like there was enough flexibility around the idea of what it means for you as a human being to heal. At the same time, like, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Right, (laughs) right. Like without planting too much of an idea about what exactly I'm looking for, like you have a sense maybe of what that means. And I think partially, you know, I was really inspired from working with clients and hearing people talk about healing unprompted. People would just bring up, you know, I'm still healing or I'm still working, you know, and I often found myself like wanting to ask a lot of questions about that. But, you know, that wasn't really the focus because we're doing residential treatment or, you know, it just like Mm. wasn't the moment to really unpack it. So I think that kind of gave me even more of a sense of like, okay, this is maybe something that needs to be explored because people are talking about it and and I have energy around it and I'm curious about it. So I wonder if other people are curious Mm -hmm. about it and are going through that. From a research perspective, you know, I think the last 50 years of research is so focused on maintaining abstinence. Like that is the holy grail of outcome measures when it comes to addiction. And like, I get it, you know, like, I don't want to say that that's not worthwhile. That's so worthwhile. Like, it's amazing to be maintaining abstinence. If you've been in the throes of addiction and you're struggling so much, like just not using, I can't imagine how difficult that is and unimaginable it is for people. So I don't want to knock that at all. But at the same time, like, what's the point of not using unless you feel better? Right. Unless you love your life. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You know, it's it's not enough to just not be using, like you have to be loving life too. And I think that that's so possible. So why aren't we talking about that? Why aren't we thinking about that? Well, why as a country are we not thinking about that for our own lives, regardless of addiction? Yeah. Like why isn't that the goal? Why isn't that Mm -hmm. something that we're thinking of as being achievable? 
I think too, you know, I was inspired seeing this study that they did. And I, I wish I could do the citation off the top of my head, but it was like comparing well-being in the general population to people in recovery. And in general, found that people who are in recovery reported higher levels of well-being compared to the general population, which I thought was just really striking because then it's like, okay, there's something about going through recovery or being somebody who's in recovery that allows you to feel better than other people who haven't done that. Right. And that's pretty inspiring, you know, because right. we think of it as being something like, oh, you never want to go through that. What's such a burden? And certainly that's the case, but also like you seem to have gained something really meaningful and valuable from that experience too. Oh, my clients who have had longer term recovery now, because now I've been in private practice six years. And so some folks have like six years on and sure. they'll tell me they're grateful for their addiction. And I'm sure you heard a million times when you'd go to meetings, I'm a grateful recovering addict or grateful recovering alcoholic. And mm -hmm. I talk about that in the detox too, because I said, you know, who hears this phrase, I'm a grateful addict. And then inside their head goes, what the fuck are you talking about? And, <laughs> and usually that's, they raise their hand. And, sure, and so then yeah. I just kind of share the experience that my clients have shared with me that if they hadn't become addicted, they wouldn't have found their best selves. And yeah. I think when our lives get burnt to the ground, you have a choice of whether you succumb to that and mm -hmm. whether you decide that your life is worth it and you're going to make changes. And I think the coolest thing about 12-step recovery is the community. And I really think that's what's lacking in general society. It's so hard to spend time with my fucking friends now because we're all so fucking busy. And this right. podcast actually is a great way for me to have amazing conversations that make my life better because right. I know I'm not alone. Yeah. And I share this so that other people know that they're not alone. Like lately, I've just been feeling this intense pressure to save everybody. It's this, yeah. this crazy thing. And this whole week, I've had so many random conversations that have shown up that are reminding me, you are not the only one doing this work. Talking yeah. to you today, you're doing this work. I went to my Al-Anon meeting yesterday and like all of those folks are doing the work. Like we yeah. really are in this together and it helps me like, I started feeling that feeling again today and then was just like, right, I'm just gonna turn it over because it's not mine. This is for the collective. Yeah. And that's what happens in recovery for people when they heal, right? Yeah, I think you're dead on. And I think the phrase that keeps coming over and over in my head hearing you share that is that idea of meaningful connection or mm -hmm. meaningful conversation. You know, it's not yeah. just spending time with people. It's like really connecting and about something that matters to both of you. And I think there's there's such right. a deep hunger for that. I hear so many people kind of searching for that, maybe even not really being able to put the words to it, but looking for that sort of like deep connection and understanding with one another and right. harder and harder to find, right? Everybody's so yeah. busy, it becomes shallower and shallower because it's all we can spare of ourselves, you know, or it's scarier and scarier to reach out. But I think, you know, of the few folks that I've talked to, that's a common theme that I've heard is just like the importance of human connection, whatever that has looked like, whether that's like, you know, with friends and family, whether that's in recovery groups, like that has been transformative mm -hmm. for people. And I think that's a human experience too. It's just as right. present for you and I. Are there other things that have come out in your, your questions that you can share? Is it too early to share anything? Yeah, I think I, I kind of want to share like maybe some like early things that are coming up, but I also, yeah, you know, if yeah. anybody's listening, I don't want to like influence them <laughs> one way or another either. Right. So I'll try, right. to, try to walk the balance there. You use the phrase like burned to the ground when their lives have been burned to the ground. I'm yeah. um, talking about people who were early stages of recovery. And I, I was struck by that phrase because there was somebody that I talked to who was using the metaphor of like a forest fire in their yeah. life. People's trust in me, like that's burned. Like, you know, my yeah. reputation, that's burned. Like all these things, you know, and I was really struck by that word burned. And they were like, you know, but that fire needed to happen to make way for new growth and new mm -hmm, change. And like mm -hmm. ended up using this whole like ecological model, which I thought was just like beautiful way to describe, so amazing. you know, is this person that I wouldn't have necessarily expected it to go there. And they just pull out this whole like fully formed, here's the structure of my inner reality compared to a forest. And you're like, wow. I Damn. mean, I was just, <laughs> yeah, I was overwhelmed by that. And it made so much sense to me because it's the new growth that needs to happen. You know, there was, yes. there was an appreciation for them that what they were doing before wasn't really working and that some things needed to burn to make way for new growth. Right. And I don't think we think of addiction as being like fuel for new growth. 
You know, like that's such a different way to think about it than what I've heard people talk about. I love that idea because we don't just do things without a purpose. Right. You know, there's a reason that we do what we do. And if we don't appreciate and respect the reasons that we do things, then we miss potentially like opportunities to understand ourselves better or to be more aligned with our lives and our values and, you know, whatever else is the meaning. So I think it's, yeah, it was just a really powerful example. And, and to hear that from you as well just tells me, you know, yeah, like there's something to that. There's something to that imagery. Maybe that's the title of the book or something, something about the forest, you know, yeah, like you right. write a dissertation and then turn it into <laughs> an excellent like book. Right. I've never really thought too much about writing a book before, but I've been mm. really... Yeah, I've been really excited about the possibility of doing something like that, just because I'd love to make it accessible in a way yes. to folks. Part of what I had to do for the dissertation to explain like why or sort of defend like what's the purpose of this, like who cares question, mm -hmm. you know, was to say like who this would be helpful for. And I started with like, oh, it'll be helpful for like addiction professionals and like other people to understand. But I was like, but actually, Everyone. no, it's probably... Yeah, like maybe it's helpful for everyone, the people who are living through it, their friends and family, or just like human beings in general, just to hear about a healing journey, you know, right. in one way or another. And then, of course, that got me on to like, oh, my gosh, I need to do a book. I want to do another like 45 studies with like different aspects and communities and people that are involved in healing what that looks like for them. And, mm -hmm. you know, it was like, like five lifetimes worth of work that kind of came up in front of me, which made me so excited because it's like, well, maybe other people would want to be involved in this too. And we can, we can do this together because healing isn't an idea that I came up with. Like, yeah, e it's like, I'm raising my yeah. hand. <laughs> e I want to do it. Yeah. Yeah. I was inspired by other people talking about healing. It's something that indigenous cultures have been talking about since the dawn of time. So, so many people are so far ahead of me thinking about these things that I'm like, oh my gosh, like, I'm glad that I have finally seen the bandwagon a little bit here and tried to do something meaningful to participate with it. But it's this metaphysical thing that human beings have been thinking about for so long that I've finally found my way to. And you know what I'm thinking of? No pressure here. But obviously, our insurance industry needs to change because access to care fucking sucks. Yeah. And when I think about the treatment centers where I would send people in order to do their work. So I actually, I had this happen fairly recently. I was trying to help a client get into treatment. And of course, clients are always like, well, I, I want to use my insurance. I want it to be in network. The problem oh, yeah. with that is, right. is that the insurance then dictates the length of stay. Right. And people don't know this. People don't understand what in-network versus out-of-network means and why most treatment providers are out-of-network for like residential level care. And so, mm -hmm. you know, we called a place that was in-network and they said, oh yeah, you're covered 100%. And I said, how many days? And they said, well, normally with this type of plan, it's only 14 days and then the rest is out of pocket. <laughs> exactly, right? Yeah. And then the other places that we called, they said, this is the out-of-network rate and you can stay as long as you want, right? And so yeah. the in-network is actually a worse deal than the out-of-network. So what I'm thinking of in terms of this research is the treatment centers that do the really good work, they are focused on healing. They're utilizing modalities that our fucking CBT. Sorry, guys. I know people hate when I just harp on CBT, but it is not the fucking end all be all for trauma. It just isn't. Research has shown that over and over again. Sure, CBT can be great for some things, but I think it's a band aid to the deeper issues. So they're using somatic modalities that really address the underlying trauma. They do ceremony, right? They yeah. utilize these indigenous practices. You know, a lot of times they'll have someone employed there who's been trained by a shaman or, or someone like that. And those are the people that I see thriving the people that get that and get to be in an environment where healing is what the goal is, not sobriety, not abstinence. Yeah. So let's change the fucking insurance industry. A hundred percent. And I think it's such deep work when you think about, you said that you do groups with trauma and shame. And I'm like, yeah, that's the deep work. Like yeah. that's the stuff that keeps coming up in one way or another. Mm -hmm. And I agree, like CBT can be incredibly helpful and it can get us started. But I don't know if it's the full Megillah for everyone to really be able to work through and explore like such a whole person experience that addiction is. Right. So, yeah, having access to things where we're really focused on treating what might be driving the thing 
rather than sort of like trying to mop up the fires or the manifestations of it, right? Yeah. Which I think takes us to this idea that addiction is really just a way of trying to deal with things. I mean, for all the like complexity of the brain science and whatnot, in some ways, that's really what it comes down to. So I would, I would love to see some changes with that and talking about access to care. You know, that was something that I was really struck by too in the folks that I've talked with where they kind of describe like this set of circumstances that needed to be in place for them to be able to start to make a change, right? right? It's like they had to like call somebody who they knew would like help them get started with mm-hmm. like getting help. It was the winter and they were freezing and, you know, like their dealer got busted Mm -hmm. and they knew that their family was upset and their health was failing. Like there needed to be all of these things in place in order to make this like terrible decision because it's going to be hell at first. Right. Nobody talks about withdrawal and early recovery as being anything but awful. So like, yeah, I mean, I can imagine myself like if I'm sick as a dog, there's no way that I'm thinking about anything other than stop being sick. And I know that if I use a little bit, I'll feel better. So if we have insurance companies or other people that are saying like, oh, no, you know, they can't come yet or they need to wait four weeks yep. or anything else like that, you know, we lose this little window that this person has just like painstakingly made to have this change. And anything we can do to allow people to be able to do something like that is just so right. essential. In so many ways, I think our system is set up instead of preventative, it's reactive, right? Oh, like, God. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you have to be struggling to this certain degree before Mm -hmm. we can get you set up or help you with anything. It would just be such a powerful shift to think about what do people need to thrive or what do people need to heal? Let's make sure they have access to those resources before it gets to this place where it's just so Mm -hmm. difficult because, you know, here we are asking you for a down payment for whatever treatment and you're, of course, you don't have any money. Like if you had money, you would be using because you, you wouldn't be feeling like total garbage right now. Right. And just a a random kind of example of this, I went to the gynecologist the other day and I'm 40. And so I said, it's probably time for a mammogram, right? And she was like, the doctor said, well, actually we don't do mammograms now until the age of 50. And I was like, my mom had breast cancer and I know she didn't have the BRCA gene. So it may or may not be hereditary, but wouldn't we want to do prevention Like, what the fuck is that? And she was giving me all these reasons why, you know, like, oh, you sure you can do this? But, you know, sometimes they'll do a mammogram and they'll find something and then they'll do this invasive thing. And it's not real. It's like, I still have choices, right? And I should be able to Mm -hmm. say, like, if we get back to this idea of healing, my body wants to move towards health. And I know that if I had a scan and something was on that scan, I would go internally really and and have a conversation with my body and say, is this something that needs to go or is this just part of us and it's going to be okay? Yeah, like give me the ability because trust me to know what's going on with my body. Trust me to know myself and know what I need. And I think like there's certainly something to be said for like medical professionals and giving advice, but just that idea of collaboration seems so essential, you know, right. rather than it being like, you know, we're the experts, we'll tell you what you need. It's like, well, no, mm-hmm. we're, we're both experts in our own way. Can we come mm-hmm. together and complement one another? But that's such a powerful example of, you know, something where you're like, what's the harm with this? Yeah, just the prevention, I think. Being able to move towards that as a society, I would love to see that kind of change because I think it makes sense on all levels, right? I mean, it makes sense in terms of like, even if you want to get super numbers oriented, it's going to be so much cheaper to get people the help, the support, the care when they need it, when they're open to it before, you know, 20 emergency room visits because they're literally Mm -hmm. at death's door. Like that's Mm -hmm. really expensive care. Like what can we do so that that's not where people have to end up? Right. Well, are you a healer? That's a great question. You know, I I actually had a professor that asked all of us if we were healers. Wow. uh, I love that. Yeah. Shout out to Dr. Annalise Singh, who is at the University of Georgia and does- Dr. Singh, what, what? Yeah. She does amazing work in so many different domains, but so much amazing work about healing, about healing racial trauma, Mm. about trans lives and trans identity, and just like Mm. understanding our humanness in all of its forms and this world that we've constructed for that humanness to live in and the ways that it can be so difficult. Mm. But yeah, I think so much of me wants to say, yes, I hope so. There's another part of me too that's like, you have to ask the people that I've worked with whether or not that's the case. That's a fair answer. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I really Mm -hmm. hope so. Like, and I actually had a conversation with a colleague yesterday about this, like, sense of we're not really 
making the difference in anybody's lives. Like we're helping them realize what's important to them and sort of fostering their own empowerment and change. Right. So there's part of me that's like, yeah, I'm a healer, but really I'm just sort of like, maybe like showing a lantern for your own healing that you're doing, mm -hmm. you know? And mm -hmm. like, I think in my best times as a therapist, and I'm not always there by any means, but like the best times is sort of like illuminating your own inner wisdom, illuminating your own healing potential so that you can enact those things that are right for you, you right. know, that move you towards what you value, that move you towards what you care about. And that just, that feels so transcendent to me to have, you know, those types of connections with people when, yeah. you know, you're able to talk about the meat of life in so many ways and what's really true for us as humans. So yeah, I think I'd love to say yes, you know, because Asterisks. it's, yeah, kind of, you know, because yeah. it, it, it feels so immodest at the same time to be like, oh yeah, I'm a healer, but that's yeah. the work that I'm moving towards trying to do, I think. What about you? Do you identify as a healer? Well, I, it's funny. I was just on another podcast on Friday night and she started it by, she's like, I'm going to turn your question back on you, bitch. Um, <laughs> and I said, yes. Because, I mean, mm -hmm. I truly think that we all have the capacity to be healers. Yeah. And I just happen to be in a job where I get to do it for a living. And just like you, I feel like I can call myself a healer as long as the person in front of me knows that this is their part and this is my part, right? And if they try to give me credit for their part, I'm not taking that because that's also then responsibility that's put on me. Right. And clearly I put enough fucking responsibility <laughs> on myself that I don't need any more of right. that shit, right? right? And I find like I've got a couple clients who are struggling in crisis right now and, and I feel mm. a lot of their like, oh, thank God I found you. You know, you're the one who's going to save me. And I keep saying, no, it's you doing the work. I am just just asking you the right questions. I'm just creating this space. You are the one who's showing up for this. And I do think that that's what a healer does. Yeah, I agree. And I think that reaction when it's like, no, that's you, that's not me, is also mm -hmm. like, don't sell yourself short. Don't not recognize all of who you are and all that you have to offer, which I think in the moment feels so scary. When somebody says that, like, no, you're amazing. You're right. incredible. Like, I admire you. And people are like, oh, my God, like, I can't go there. I don't see myself that way at all. But I would never want to take ownership or take credit for something that's you and your truth. Because I see so clearly that it's you that's showing up here. It's you right. that's carrying this story. And, you know, same way with that you're kind of alluding to, like, I take so much responsibility. That has been such a struggle for me in my life of, like, you know, taking responsibility for other people's feelings and, like... Adult child of an addict, anyone? Oh, <laughs> Indeed, right? Yeah, <laughs> think about those ACOA traits. You're like, oh, oh yeah, yeah, that's me and that's me. Yeah, definitely struggled with codependency in one form or another. Mm -hmm. And I think recognizing that part of allowing people to take credit for their own healing journey is knowing that like me trying to carry their burdens or take on their pain or their story doesn't help either of us. Right. Like, in a way, it kind of invalidates or devalues what they're going through. Yes. You know, and it wasn't until somebody told me that, that I was like, oh. Fuck. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Oh, mm -hmm. fuck. Yeah. I have to let people live with that. Yeah. When I think about, like, if a client tells me, like, oh, you're so amazing, you've done all these things, I really feel like I want to give it back to them because the work is what's happening in the room. It's not about me. Yeah. Outside of the therapy room... I struggle to take that feedback in and that's the time where I should take it in. And so I think it can be a practice then of helping a client learn what it's like to receive. And then every time that happens with me, I tell myself like, okay, bitch, listen to what you're saying because you're going to turn around and, you know, try to push something away that somebody gives you and you have to be able to, to receive at some point. And it's so hard for, especially those of us who have family members with addiction, we learned that it was our job to make sure everybody else was okay. That's our value, right? right. We don't have our own value independent of them. And I agree, like realizing that I have to model and practice what I'm preaching because yes. when it's you, it's like so clear for me to be able to say, oh no, you're great. Let me tell you all the ways that you're great. Mm -hmm, but when somebody mm -hmm. does that to me, I'm like, oh, I have to accept this and I have to sit with it. And that can be really uncomfortable. 
it's so vulnerable, I think. And at the same time, it's such a great window into what I'm asking other people to do. Right. Right. <laughs> so this begs the question, how do you feel about the term wounded healer? Yeah. For whatever reason, I feel like I'm much more willing to take on wounded healer than I am healer. Like mm -hmm. wounded healer, I'm like, yes, that feels right to me because I know I'm still healing myself. And I actually, with a friend of mine, wrote a paper about losing a family member in graduate school because you know my dad passed away right when I was in the middle of my master's degree mm -hmm. a couple of years ago and just like kind of how that has shaped my own development as a therapist. But I did a lot of like reading about what people had said about being a wounded healer. And I was like, yeah, mm -hmm. this, this is so real. And so it was kind of crazy to see that that's what you had named your podcast. Cause I was like, you know, this has been such a theme in my life the last couple of years, one way or another is this idea of wounding, this idea of healing, those things coming together. And, you know, at the same time, thinking about some of the interviews that I've done with folks and people talking about how doing service work and taking on sponsees mm -hmm. has been the times that have really catalyzed their own growth, because now it's like, I have to be living these principles for you. Right. I have to be giving you this example. And that's very much been the case for me with doing therapy where it's like, oh no, like I have to accept my guilt and my other emotions that I'm ashamed of and mm -hmm. my tendency to take on too much responsibility the same way that I have to accept the kindness and the compassion and the other things that are true of me also that are sometimes harder to own, especially when you're sort of an adult children when you have that mm -hmm. tendency to just push everything off and not own it. But it's been very transformative, I think, for me to recognize like, no, that is part of who I am. And I'm going to start to see myself as compassionate, both towards myself and other people, because actually that's the truth that feels right to me, scary as it is to admit something like that. Because what if somebody mm -hmm. takes it away, right? I mean, that's always the fear for me. Like somebody's going to be like, no, you're not. Like, that's not who you are. And it's like, oh no, I've been wrong. I've been an imposter this whole time. Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. But I've realized slowly more and more that one person reacting that way isn't going to take away something that I know to be true inside. I love that. Hard as it is to say, right? Mm -hmm. That's going to be the quote I pull. <laughs> so I could talk to you forever. So I might ask you to be best friends. And Sounds good. Yeah. Do you ever do Marco Polo? Uh, my partner does Marco Polo with her family. So I feel like she could teach me really well how to do it. So. Because I feel like we could have some great Marco Polo convos and come up with how you and I together, just as a duo, are going to fix everything. And yeah. that's not going to be at all acting out of our woundedness. Right. <laughs> <laughs> or like appropriately acting out of woundedness, right? right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. So first of all, who are you looking for for this study? Yeah, how can sure. they find that information? Yeah, so I'm looking for folks in the Milwaukee or Chicago area for now. Certainly be interested in talking to more folks in the future when things open up, but I had to start kind of small, who have three years or more of continuous abstinence from opioids. In that three years, you can be on medication-assisted treatment, suboxone, mm -hmm. methadone. That's totally fine. You can still be doing that, but you can't be actively using other substances. Like you can't actively mm -hmm. be using opioids. And then be able to describe like a personal journey of whole person healing. Like how have mm -hmm. you meaningfully gotten better from opioid addiction? Like what mm -hmm. have been the things that have happened? At least 25 years old and willing to give a 60 to 90 minute interview. It can be Skype. It can be in person, kind of, you know, whatever's most facilitative and easiest for people. And a $20 gift card for anybody that's willing to participate, because I know it's a big investment of mm -hmm. people's time and story and energy. And the best way to get in touch with me is email or phone. My email is james.mcdonald, M-C-D-O-N-A-L-D, just like the restaurant, as my dad used to say, um, <laughs> at marquette.edu. M-A-R-Q-U-E-T-T-E. -E. And we'll post all this for people too. Oh, great. I appreciate that. And I encourage anybody who's at all interested to get in touch with me. Like I mm -hmm. am more than happy to like link you to, you know, the screening survey to see if you qualify or just talk with you and figure out if you're going to mm -hmm. be a good fit. Don't feel like you're going to bother me at all. And it's, it's actually been kind of hard to find people that are willing to participate, that meet the criteria, who mm -hmm. are willing to share their story. So if you meet the criteria or if you work with people who might be mm -hmm. interested, please reach out to me and I would love your help at kind of getting the word out so that some of these stories can be shared. 
Yeah. So, you know, if you're listening and you know someone that you love in recovery, please share this. I find these things find the people who need them. And I really, really believe in James's work and something really big is going to happen. I just feel it. I'm predicting big things for you. Well, thank you. And and I think hopefully it ends up being big things for the community because, yes. you know, that's the core of all the work that we do. And I'm imagining, you know, this resonates with you, but so much of the value of doing this work is seeing that it directly makes people's lives better. And that is just... That's everything. Yeah, that's everything. Mm-hmm. Yeah, couldn't say it better. Mm-hmm. That's everything. So hopefully things get better. Yeah. Well, thank you so, so, so much for this. Yeah, of course. My pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. It was a joy to talk about it. Good. Thank you. Wasn't that awesome? Isn't James super cool? I am so mad that his phone is too old to do Marco Polo because I invited him to be a Marco Polo friend and his phone is just too old for it and I'm mad about it. (laughs) But James is awesome. And so as I said in the beginning of this interview, you know, if you are a person who qualifies for his study or if you know somebody who qualifies for his study, please, please reach out directly to James so that we can help other people come to healing from addiction. So thank you so much, James, for being on the show. To find all the info for where to reach him, you can go to our website at www.headhearttherapy.com slash podcast. Thanks as always to the Creative Imposter Studios for editing, to Liam O'Donnell for the album art, and to Ben Mueller for our theme music. All right, you guys, this is it for the holidays. Thank you so much, and we'll see you next year. Bye-bye.